Okay, so first and foremost, thank you for the invitation and uh, uh, just my project because Nika uh, Valiporovsky. Uh, it's the reason, okay, I just, just talk in Russian with just some words. So uh, my point here is to, um, to have a discussion about uh, evolutionary logic especially. And if you want to say exactly how my talk is connected with Christ's philosophy, I can give you an answer at the end of the talk. Not right now, please. So, um, the plan of this talk is uh, divided into uh, four parts. I prefer to skip some pages because it's too long, I think. And some philosophical uh, slides can be skipped for, for the purpose. So, the first I have to, uh, to give a definition of uh, iterative verse. Then I would like to emphasize on a very specific case of verb to doubt. Because doubt for me is very interesting as a specific uh, case of verb to be iterated. As a third, uh, third part of the content, I would like to make a uh, relation between iteration and elocution, because I, uh, according to me, elocution is the key in order to find exactly to, uh, uh, to understand why you are uh, entitled to iterate or not. And as a conclusion, we make a different, uh, distinction between positive and negative iterations, because uh, the rules in order to iterate first are different, whether the verb is positive or negative. So, by definition, iterative is just a verb, uh, something which occurs repeatedly and applies to oneself. Uh, it's, very, it's a very famous case in modern logic, for instance. Uh, for those who know modern logic, uh, ontic, temporal, epistemic logic are very, very uh, accustomed with iteration. For instance, I believe that I believe, I know that I know, uh, I hope that I hope, so to say. It's, 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 more, uh, it's more seldom as a case. And uh, in multimodal logics, you are very used to iterate the sort of uh, functions you have. For instance, it would be the case, temporal, that you know epistemic that are out, deontic, uh, to do something. So you can iterate, so to say. But in this talk, I, only, I will only talk about the uh, iterative from one the same verb. I believe that I believe, I, be uh, I know that I know, but not I believe that I know. Just one sort of verb will be iterated. So here you have. Uh, very famous uh, theorems from uh, epistemi uh, modern logic in general, the S4 and S5, the Lewis system, uh, and pretty especially with uh, we iterate uh, x is a function, so x is something for believe, to know, to doubt, uh, everything you want, and you iterate uh, an affirmative verb or a negative verb. Okay? For instance, S5 uh, replace x by no. This means that uh, if I don't know that P is the case, I know that I don't know that P is the case. So this is a sort of iteration. So now my question is the following one. <coughs> to what extent does the iteration of a verb make sense? When is it meaningful to iterate a verb? For instance, I walk that I walk, no sense. Uh, I go that I go, no sense. I believe that I believe, say it's meaningful. I know that I know, it's meaningful. So the question is, when does it make sense to iterate? That's the question. An empirical investigation made me uh, think that uh, <coughs> um, this verse makes sense. We can iterate, for instance, belief, know, doubt, think, want, fear, remember, forget, desire, refuse, and so on. And we can uh, remark that each of these verse belongs to the family of uh, what Russell, Bertrand Russell called propositional attitudes. Because these verbs uh, are psychological verbs, it has to, they have to do with one state of mind, in general. So, for instance, in epistemic logic, we have the right to say, if I know that P is the case, then I know that I know, or A knows, A is the agent, A knows that A knows that P. This does make sense. So, this is the case of uh, iteration from epistemic logic. So, we can have other sorts, bullic logic. Bullic has to do with uh, uh, will, the will. I want something. Bullic logic has been divided by, um, devised by a French philosopher and logician, uh, Gardiès, and he proposed to say what is exactly the logic of the verbs like to want. I want that I want, I desire that I desire, etc. This does make sense. So, my thesis is the following one. I have three different theses. So, at iteration is a psychological attitude submitted to conversational rules. So, we have a first case. In one case, iteration is redundant. We don't... Uh, no information is augmented with iteration. So, iteration is redundant if and if the verb is positive, 
and the pronoun, the pronoun that is used in the sentence, I, we, you, uh, enters an interlocutional relation between the speaker who talks and the hearer who listens to. The first case. The second case, the iteration is self-contradictory, pragmatically contradictory, as I will uh, explain just later on. If you only if the verb is negative, not positive, and the pronoun enters an interlocutional relation between the speaker and the hearer. And the third case, Iteration is contingent in every other case. So it makes sense, it absolutely does, does not make sense, or it depends in the third case. And in the third case, it's just a case in which a firm uh, does not entail uh, an irrecusual relation between the speaker and the hearer. The success conditions of iterative refer to two special acts. The first is uh, the success condition of assertive acts, because the success condition has to do with an assertion. And another way to uh, explain exactly how iterations make sense is a case in which we say that the problem has to do with the truth conditions of epistemic acts. So I make, I make a correlation between assertion and uh, epistemic sentences because Hintika does the same, did the same in uh, one book from uh, 62, uh, Knowledge and Belief, especially. By extension, you can say that, for instance, I affirm that I affirm, I say that I say, uh, are exactly on a par with these uh, psychological verbs. And in general, you can say that uh, uh, speech acts, in this case, we have speech acts, when I say that I know, when I said to believe, and speech acts are defined to be uh, public expressions of mental states. Uh, these speech acts are supposed to, uh, are used to express mental states or thoughts in general. Okay. So I propose a logical analysis of uh, uh, iterities. So first, What's exactly the meaning of, uh, uh, for an, an iterative to be negative? I just use this expression, but I have to explain this. So an iterative is negative if it can be reduced to a negative propositional attitude. So let me just give uh, some examples. Uh, two examples, especially doubt and forget. Because if I doubt, I don't believe that P is the case, and I don't believe at the same time that P is not the case. Forget, if I forget something, I don't remember. So, doubt is the negation of remembering. Here we have triangle, triangles of contrarieties. Contrarieties means that uh, these sort of propositions, sentences, cannot be true at once. So, for instance, I define doubt as a function to be applied to a proposition P. So, DP means I doubt that P is the case. And P is defined as uh, the, consumption, the negative consumption of uh, knowledge about P and knowledge about not P. So, I don't P means that I don't believe either that P or not P, or I don't know either that P or not P. The same for, for uh, to forget. Forget means that I don't remember that P, whether P, and I don't remember, remember whether P means that I don't remember that P is the case, and I don't remember at the same time that P is not, uh, P is not the case. So that's the reason why I say that these verbs are negative verbs, because they can be uh, passed into negative sentences. Yeah. And the, uh, once again, these verbs relate to conscious processes. Remember, doubt, belief, uh, knowing something, it has to do with uh, uh, awareness, conscious processes. About thought, they were speaking. Okay? So now I have to uh, have a discussion about thought, of course. Because uh, French philosopher Descartes, René Descartes, uh, was very, very uh, concerned by the question of thought, of course, uh, because of the cogito, uh, cogito ad usum. And uh, Descartes say, what is thinking? Thinking is doubting, wanting, feeling. So I would like now to emphasize about the very specific case of thought, doubting. So, a definition of doubt has been given by Descartes, for instance, but what then am I? As thinking say, it has been said, but what if a thinking thing? It's a thing that doubts, understands, conceives, affirms, denies, wills, refuses, but imagines as though and perceives. So Descartes introduced, of course, doubt as a specific case of thought into among another, uh, all other ones. So here we have a different sets of verbs, and this uh, verbs refer to uh, mental acts, mental states, or fourth acts. So we have positive acts, to conceive, to affirm, to want, to imagine, to perceive, and negative acts, to doubt, to deny, to refuse. 
So two sorts of uh, uh, graph to be iterated on it. So uh, in order to define uh, doubt, as I just said uh, two slides uh, ago, in doubt the mind vacillates, cannot choose any one of the incompatible uh, predicates, sentences or attitude and come to rest. So I cannot make a decision about whether P is the case or not P is the case. So I doubt, I vacillate between both stations and then I come to rest. That's the stance of the skeptic who doubts about everything. This is a formalization, possible formalization of doubting and uh, for those who are uh, formed with uh, modal logic or uh, accustomated, doubt is something like an epistemic counterpart of contingency uh, it's negation of necessity it's neither necessary is that P or not P I don't believe that P or I don't believe that not P so it's negative, it's a negative uh, attitude so uh, the point of Descartes about doubt is according to him it's not possible to doubt one's doubt According to Descartes, to say I doubt that I doubt doesn't make sense. It's totally false. So the question is why? A Cartesian analysis of doubt has been given by Sibajiban uh, in the paper in mind and in six thesis. So the first is according to the thesis of reflexive consciousness, the subject is aware of any of his or her thoughts. It's the terms of uh, self illumination represented by Descartes. In, uh, uh, metaphysical meditations. Second, doubt is a sort of thought. It's a specific thought. Therefore, the subject is aware of any of his doubts because doubt is a case of uh, conscious act. So it's a consequence of one and two. First, firstly, the cosmical argument amounts to the certainty of self-consciousness. Okay? Now, to be certain is the same as to know, according to this very def uh, specific definition of knowledge. Uh, in Descartes. And as a general conclusion, if the subject doubts P, that means that uh, uh, as a consequence, he knows that she doubts P. Because the doubt is a specific thought, and according to the, the, this premise one, is supposed to uh, be certain or to be uh, clearly conscious about this act. That's the point of Descartes. That's the reason why, as a conclusion, it's not possible to doubt one's doubt. So, this sort of uh, uh, formula. So DP in terms uh, DDP is totally false according to Descartes. It's not possible. So the uh, negation, if I doubt, I don't doubt that I doubt, is something like a tautology according to Descartes. It's uh, always true. So, and to iterate doubt is something like a self-contradiction. It's not possible to doubt one's doubt according to Descartes' uh, thesis of self-elimination, of the reflective consciousness. Now, Sibajiban has uh, an objection against uh, Descartes' doubt because at, according to Sibajiban, uh, the Cartesians, or Descartes specifically, uh, supposes that doubt is a universal attitude. Doubt is applied to absolutely everything. So, I doubt about something, or I doubt about this doubt, are one the same doubt, according to Descartes. So it's something like, uh, in set theory, you can say that some, uh, doubt is something like an uh, ultimate place. So nothing is beyond this sort of attitude. This attitude encompasses absolutely every thought. And Sibajiban replied to Descartes, why is doubt supposed to be a universal attitude, to be applied to absolutely everything? So according to Sibajiban, Descartes needs to state, needs to uh, use this uh, premise Universal, universality of doubt in order to make his point about the impossibility of doubting one's doubt. So Sebajiban say, how can you say that uh, uh, doubt is universal? You don't have any empirical evidence about this because it's something transcendental. It has to do with metaphysics. So that was the, the premise, the objection of Sebajiban against uh, Descartes' point against the iteration of doubt. Both. I prefer to skip this sort of uh, explanation because I have another way to explain exactly why it's not possible to doubt one's doubt. My explanation is a performatory interpretation of the Cartesian cogito. Performative in the sense that it has to do with uh, elocutionary logic, speech acts. So, according to Descartes, the statement of universal doubt is expressed, expressed by means of an assertion. I said something. And an assertion is a speech act. So, whenever you want to defend Descartes' uh, position, 
you introduce the name of uh, the concept of assertion, and assertion is a speech act. So I want to right now to introduce uh, this sort of argument for Descartes' position about, against the iteration of uh, uh, doubt. So Hentika in uh, 85 say the cogito proof cogito ego sum is not an inference. It's not a logical proof. It's a performance. So as you know, <laughs> performance is that I am doing something. That's I'm doing something, as this very doing, this very making something, is the explanation to uh, the existence of the subject, who thinks anything. So for instance, think about, just replace, uh, I think but I walk. I walk, therefore I am, is not a logically valid sentence. It's not a proof of existence. Walking is not a proof of existence. So now if you replace walking by thinking, this works, because I think, therefore I am, is something self-evident. So the very meaning of thinking is crucial in order to uh, to explain the relation between uh, the, the first part and the second part of the sentence. So we cannot replace by any sort of verb. Thinking is very crucial because thinking is a thought, and thought is expressed by the speech. So here we have a sort of sentence. Okay, I think, therefore I am. The English translation of cogito ego sum, or in French, je pense donc je suis, as Descartes said. This sentence can be translated into an utterance. For instance, I think, therefore I am, means the same as I say, I say, I exist. J'existe, je suis, in French. So I make an action, a performance. And this performance is translated with the sentence I think, therefore I am. The same for I don't exist. I don't exist, je n'existe pas. I just say, say to you, I don't exist. This is self contradictory because I just made a speech act. Another case, I doubt. I doubt, think that the same as I feel that I doubt. This makes sense in this case. So, now the third part is uh, more, some more precise details about elocution, what's the meaning exactly of uh, elocution. So, in uh, logic in general, we have two different sorts of paradoxes. You have locutionary paradoxes and you have elocutionary paradoxes. Uh, the locutionary uh, level of language is related with sentences. The elocutionary level of language has to do with statements, not the same. When you state, you use a sentence. The sentence is a content. And you make something, you perform something with the sentence. When you are working with elocutionary logic, you are not especially interested with your content, but the sort of action you, you process or you perform about this content. And that's the level of language I want to use in order to explain exactly the meaning of uh, iteration. So just think about I know that P. If you say that I know that P, that means that you affirm something. If you say I doubt P, you affirm, you just affirm that you doubt. So in both cases, A means affirmation. So you affirm something in both cases, about two different sorts of uh, speech acts, knowing epistemic acts, knowing doubting. But in both cases, you affirm. Yeah, so we have this sort of uh, uh, translation within epistemic logic, I can speak this. Fitch and Moore's paradox are very interesting in this case, because uh, Fitch and Moore's paradox are very, very famous paradoxes from epistemic logic. And this paradox will have problems with the uh, your logical uh, demonstration. And the conclusion is weird, strange. Something is wrong with the conclusion. If you uh, use a neurocutionary approach of this sentence, so if you prefer to uh, think these paradoxes in terms not of sentences but in terms of statements, the paradox seems to vanish. Just it disappears. Because the level of your approach of the problem is not of the same level. You are interested in two statements in this case. So, Fitch proposes sort of theorem. So, if uh, not A but alpha, if alpha is a truth class which is close with respect to presentation and elimination, so the sort of proposition is itself necessarily not a member of alpha. It's not true, so to say. So, and you can just replace alpha with different sort of verbs. You can replace with uh, being true, believe, snow, being sure, being certain, or not doubting, but uh, uh, everything is supposed to contain the truth. If I know something, it entails that the content I know is true. So just uh, encompass the verbs that entail the truth, and these verbs are con uh, concerned by the uh, fish theorem. Uh, so, 
let's say most paradox first in the first place. So most paradox is something like I uh, think when you say uh, it's raining, but I don't believe that it rains. This is something is wrong in this sentence. But it's not logically wrong. If you have a very classical analysis, logical analysis of this sentence, nothing is wrong. Nothing is uh, inconsistent. But if you turn the level of analysis, if you don't think in terms of sentences but in terms of statements, performances, something is clearly clearly wrong. Okay, so you have to change the meaning and the sen to change the formalization of the sentence. Think about the sentence number one. I forget. Or I forget that my train leaves at 7 p.m. Second, he forgets that he forgets that his train leaves at 7 p.m. You just change the pronoun. The first case is absurd. The second is totally normal. It's because you change the pronoun. You cannot contradict or you cannot just uh, discuss or doubt what you just asserted. That's the reason why you cannot say, I forget that I forget. Because if you say something, you cannot forget what you just say. It's stupid. So that's the reason why the sentence one is self-contradictory, not the second one. And this sort of sentences, are, according to me, are on a par with the most paradox. It's exactly the same problem. Forget to believe are contained by the same general problems. So we can say that one is the counterpart of more paradox. It's not raining, but I believe that it's raining, or it's raining, but I don't believe that it's raining. The problem is exactly the same in both cases. We forget and, uh, and believe it. Yeah. So any variant of more paradox is consistent only if x is not a pronoun of the first or the second person. If you say, for instance, it's raining, but he doesn't believe that it's ra it rains, it's good, it's okay. Now, it ra it's raining, but we don't believe, we don't believe that it's raining, it's contradictory. Because the pronoun we consents your own assertion, your own position. Yeah, so for the conditions for assertion is that the speaker is supposed to believe what he says. It's something like a conventional rule. You are supposed to believe what you say. So if you say that we, it's, you don't believe that it rains, why have you just said that it rains? It rains if you don't believe it rains at the same time. So something is wrong in this sentence because you violate the uh, clause of sincerity proposed by Moore. So exactly the same situation uh, occurs with Fitch paradox. Fitch paradox, you replace belief by no, and you have exactly the same sort of sentence here. You have uh, it's very specific, uh, the, the philosophical context of this paradox has to do with uh, anti-realism. How can you define knowledge for an uh, anti-realist? If something is true, it's possible for me to come to know that P is true. But this sort of very natural, normal sentence creates a paradox with this sort of demonstration. The paradox is that, as a conclusion, we say that if I accept that if something is true, it's possible for me to come later on to know that P is true. The conclusion is, if P is true, I actually know that P is true. And this is not correct. So that's the, the gist of Fitch's paradox. So if you have a, an evolutionary approach of this paradox, the culprit, the, the guilty uh, sentence in this case, is uh, premise 1. Because P and I don't know that P cannot be uttered. It's a, uh, something is wrong with a statement, P and I don't know that P. Because it's totally normal to say as a sentence that there are no truths. Of course, P can be true without me knowing it, of course. At the same time, as an utterance, it's not possible because an naturalist cannot affirm the truth of P if it's not, pos if it's not possible for him to know that P is true. So this sort of statement cannot be performed by an anti -realist. I cannot say P is true and I don't know if I am an anti -realist. I don't have the right to say P is true. So the premise one is to be just skipped from an evolutionary uh, approach of uh, Fitch's paradox. That's a problem. So, uh, five minutes? Okay. Five minutes? Okay, so I have to, to, to skip some uh, excessive parts. So, yeah. The point is that executionary logic is concerned with assertions because according to me in this presentation I say that whenever you say something you assert something but if you are interested with executionary logic uh, assertion is not the, the only one 
of the uh, different uh, um, speech acts. We have different sorts of speech acts outside a session. But I have to explain this point. Because, for instance, forgetting. It's not possible to say I forget that P, and I, it's not possible to say I forget that I forget, because it, it, it's at odds with what you say, what you assert. Now the point is that, yes, let's do objections. Is any utterance an assertive act? If not every speech act is an assertion, in this case you cannot apply uh, the rule of iterations for every speech act, because not every utterance is, is an assertion. But now, for instance, you have five classes of uh, interlocutionary force uh, in Sir's uh, book from 65, uh, 60, uh, 69 speech acts. We have something like asserting, surmising, supposing, believing, fearing, hoping. Hoping is not an assertion. I can hope something without asserting anything, of course. So, that's the reason why I would like to say in this case that it's totally consistent to say I hope that I hope. It's consistent to say I fear that I fear, because fearing and hoping has nothing to do with assertion. So, once you've, the verb you used uh, is in contradiction with the assertion you just made, there is something like a, a self contradiction. If the verb you want to iterate is not an assertion or is not in contradiction with assertion, everything is fine. You don't have anything uh, like a self contradiction between the verb and the iteration of the verb. For instance, fearing. Fearing is the same as I hope that something is not the case. It's nothing uh, in contradiction with assertion, for instance. Though so I fear that I fear, I hope that I hope, are perfectly fine. They are contingent. Not tautological, so to say, not self contradictory, contingent. I can hope that I hope, I can hope that I don't hope, everything is contingent in this case. And the same for fearing. Forgetting the same. Forgetting is just not to remember. So I forget that I forget is contradictory in the case because it is in contradiction with you, the assertion you just made with the sentence. So I cannot forget that I forget. Okay? So, so doubting, for instance, is the same as ignoring, and ignoring is opposed to the act of asserting. That's the reason why doubting one's doubt is self-contradictory. Fearing is just not hoping, and not hoping P is not opposed to the act of asserting P, so everything is fine. That's all. So as a general conclusion, I have to skip. Yeah, a very clear dif difference has to be made between two sorts of negation. Uh, if you negate something, you can commit into the falsity of the sentence. This is a, a strong negation. I assert that P is false. Another view of negation is a weak, a weaker negation. It's uh, uh, I deny that P is the case because I don't know absolutely everything, anything about P. In this case, I don't. So I have two sorts of uh, negation. Weak negation, it's the same as doubting, and strong negation, it's not doubting, it's knowing the falsity of the sentence. And a very interesting point is that. Uh, Parsons say in uh, 84 that, for instance, think about the liar paradox. The liar paradox is this sentence is false, or this sentence is not true. In both cases, we have a contradiction because you assert something. Now, if you say uh, I, uh, this sentence is not true, if this uh, sentence, this statement says the same as I don't assert that this sentence is true or false, you don't assert anything, so you just doubt. If you doubt, you don't assert the falsity of the sentence. So everything is fine. Because you don't assert, so there is nothing such as a liar paradox with this meaning of negation as a weak negation. Non-commitment about the meaning of uh, the sentence. So, uh, as a conclusion, yeah, so you, you can iterate if your verb is not in contradiction with the, the act of asserting. You can reduce if, uh, in case, reduce uh, I fear that I fear means the same as I fear, or I know that I know means the same as I know. It depends exactly. So the question is when is it the same to reduce or to iterate? That's the question. So when you have both operations are on a part, on a part, so, uh, sorry, in order to avoid infinite regression. I know that I know that I know that I know that I know means exactly the same as I know. I doubt that I doubt that I doubt means the same I, as I doubt. Okay? But Doubting is very different from the logical behavior of knowledge because doubting creates a self-contradiction uh, with respect to the assertion. So we have to be cautious with the meaning of, uh, of doubting.
So I think it's too long, so I have just have to conclude. Uh, let me just finish by a general checklist of uh, iterative verbs you can use, you can find uh, in, with your language. So think into Russian, for instance, and wonder yourself, uh, uh, does it make sense to say this sort of iteration as an existence? As an example, I think that I think, it's okay. Or I don't think that I don't think. I care to care, I don't care not to care. Makes sense. I love to love, that was a thing, very famous from the 70s. I love to love. Seems that it does make sense, it seems so, because loving is an attitude, a psychological attitude. I don't know not to love, or I hate to hate. I hate to hate means the same as uh, I don't want to hate. For instance, I hate to hate. I don't, I regret to regret. I don't regret, not to regret. I forget that I forget, don't forget that I don't forget. Or I refuse to refuse, I don't refuse, not to refuse, etc. etc. We just we can say that in each of these cases we have something psychological to verb. And I think that the only way to have, make sense with uh, iteration is for the verb to be psychological. And the only reason, the only way not to create a contraction with the verb is the verb not to be in contraction with the act of assertion. So two different theses. Uh, in the presentation, so it's possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Well, uh, uh, I, in one of your uh, examples of uh, verbs that cannot iterate, were on the part doubt, forget, and deny. But I think that deny is different from forget and doubt, because I, I deny that I deny makes complete sense. Double negation. No, I deny. <laughs> I deny. So I, 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 because we understand the second deny as some someone thinking of us that we or saying that we denied something and we opposed to it. We say I deny that I deny. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, yeah, thanks for your question mm -hmm. because I I partly agree with the point. Denying is not exactly the same as forgetting mm -hmm. or doubting. Mm -hmm. The question is, what is exactly the meaning of denying? Mm -hmm. uh, I made the distinction between two sorts of negation. Mm -hmm. A strong negation and a weak negation. Mm -hmm. A strong negation means that I assert that something is not the case. Mm -hmm. Another way to use negation is I don't assert anything. Mm -hmm. So the question yeah, is, is where, exactly, where is denying? Where is denying exactly? I, I only asked why we were on... on mm -hmm. in, Yes. Yes, that's it. It was the beginning of. Yes. Here, this what was understandable. Mm -hmm. So when you say I deny that I deny, uh, it depends exactly on the sort of meaning you are you are assigned to denying. If you say that denying is just uh, saying that something is false, mm -hmm. of course, deny that I deny makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not inconsistent. Mm -hmm. Now, if denying means the same as. Um, Rejecting my own assertion, in this case there is a problem, because I cannot reject my own assertion. But if I say that denying means an assertion, in this case this is a strong sense of denying. So I deny that I deny is contradictory if you only if or only if only, so to say, denying is translated as a strong negation. But I deny that I deny makes sense when denying is considered as a weak negation. That's my point. And it's very interesting because this has to do with skepticism. <laughs> yeah, of course. This has to do with skepticism in philosophy. Is it possible to be consistent when you are a skeptic? I say I doubt anything, everything. Is it very possible to doubt everything? It was a point with uh, Pyro philosophy, for instance. Pyro say I doubt everything. So the question is, are you sure that you deny everything? Yes. But you just say yes, so you feel something. That's something in this vein, no? So correct, I recommend. Yeah, exactly. Precision. Uh, yes, uh, and yeah. uh, about um, uh, your one of the last slides, maybe the last. Uh, I, think, I think that I think uh, is reducible. Which word? I think. I think. I think that I think we can re reduce it to I think, as you said. Yeah. Reduction. But uh, I love to love, I, think, I, I, I doubt that <laughs> the same kind of reduction is... Uh, I, just, I just presented this verb as an example, but I, uh -huh. I didn't you, mm -hmm. fault seriously about this case. Because mm -hmm. 
what's the meaning exactly of I love to love? Mm -hmm. Love to love sense that I I'm friendly with a general attitude of love. Mm -hmm. so, yes. So <laughs> in this case, you you have something like the difference between several yeah. orders yes. of attitude. Yes. But the same is the case with knowing, for instance. I know that I know, mm -hmm. and I know don't are uh, not about the same content. Mm -hmm. I know that P is about the sentence. Mm -hmm. I know that I know that P mm -hmm. is not about the sentence. It's about my own attitude about the sentence. So yes. this case is exactly the same. Perfect. Perfect. No. Yes. Yes. So the question is now, is it possible to reduce love to love and love? Mm -hmm. According to Descartes, you say you would say yes, because if you say that love is universal, love is a general attitude to be applied to absolutely everything, you say it's the same. Now if you say that love, this meaning of love depends upon the sort of content, you would say that it's different to love it, to love and to love. But I have to think about this because uh, it was just an example that I I cannot I'm not uh, able right now to give you an answer about this. Uh, is it possible to reduce? It makes sense. But is it possible to reduce? We have to find a logical. I form. think that the sentence says I love to love something and I love something. Linguistically, of course, are, di are different, and uh, we can explain it by. Apply, applying graces <laughs> muscles, and, because they will have different implications. I will be interested. And uh, 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 it seems to me that uh, in, in the case of uh, forgetting, we have the same situation of uh, several levels. Of, uh, uh -huh. I think that I personally. Uh -huh. Uh, I can forget that I forget. <laughs> I am very absent-minded person. Uh -huh. yes. uh -huh. <laughs> uh, uh, I can imagine the situation uh -huh. that I have a list of uh, deal to do. Uh -huh. Yes. For example, I must uh, do not forget to switch off my computer. Yes. And I have a list. And I. Uh, Every morning I, I should consult it and uh, check out it. And I forget to consult my list. I forget that I forget to switch off my computer. On the metal level, I can forget that I forget. Uh, it seems to me that for me it's possible. I haven't this list, but uh, it's it possible. <laughs> yes. Yeah, especially in Russian, because uh, we, we will. In Russian, we have perfected and unperfected aspects. Yes, it's, it's something specific in Russian. For example, but my question uh, doesn't concern it's universal, it's philosophical, <laughs> not, not linguistic. I will have a reply to your objection, for instance. You said it's possible to forget and forget. Yes, okay? I. So I of course, of course, you think about, uh, think of, for instance, think about those who have uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, what? Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer. Alzheimer is this, uh, I don't have the English accent, sorry. Alzheimer is a... Uh, <laughs> ну, какой-то неизвестный нам персонаж. Альцаймер дисиз. Альцаймер дисиз. Альцаймер дисиз. Альцаймер. 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 That you forget that you forget. Can yes. you say? In, in but uh, post factum, I can say, oh, my stupid uh, head, <laughs> I forget that I forget mm -hmm. to consult. Yeah, but at the same time, if you say, you think about the things uh, I'm saying. You, you uh, cannot forget what you just said. That was my point. When you said something, uh -huh. when you said, when you utter that sentence, you are supposed to be aware of what you just said. You are supposed to know exactly what you 
state. So if you know that you state, if you, I say I forget that I forget uh, that now I, tomorrow, I did now, now I don't forget. Of okay. course, yes. Now when I uh, speak about my forgetting, mm -hmm. I I am uh, yes. Think about most products. It's for instance okay. you say uh -huh. it's raining, no. uh -huh. but I I believed. That is not really. Yes. No, I forgot. Most yesterday, yesterday, yesterday most I forgot that I forgot. But yes. now it's yes. possible. Most yes. paradoxes yes. are based yeah. on uh, felicity conditions of assertions. But in, in the case of forget, that I forget, no. No, in the case of forgetting, it has nothing to do with the felicity condition of forgetting. It has to do with the felicity condition of assertion. Because if I say something about forgetting, the problem is not concerned with forgetting, but about the assertion I just made by saying I forget something. I cannot say that I forget and to forget that I forget. Because if I say, I think about what I just said. That's the point. That's the same point with most products. With more, I cannot say that uh, I don't believe what I just asserted because of the clause of, uh, clause of sincerity. If I say I forget, I cannot <laughs> yes. think about this, this very yes. thing I just forgot. What I forget. So I can, cannot say something that I forget. Otherwise, I don't forget. I know. I'm aware. What was the point? The cases are different, nevertheless. I forget that I forget uh, to, put on, uh, to take my glasses. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if we can use the sentence perfectly because uh, I am just stating that it's my habit, it's usually, usually it is the case. Okay, uh, okay I'm used to forget the forget. Uh -huh. uh, just now I remember that. Mm -hmm. So I'm and used to forget that I forget uh, everything because I'm very absent-minded. In this case, uh, this sort of sentence does, a, does not contradict your assertion. So the explanation is the same. If your sentence contradicts your assertion, something is wrong. But yes. This sentence does not contradict because it's a very... It's a, there is a word in English which says that it's a specious present. It's a specious present. Yes. The prior sentence the, is a specious. Different, a, different meanings of pre, forms of present tense. Yeah. Of Several so uh, like fake. specific meanings. Yeah, fake or in some of them, the sentence is perfectly okay. In another uh, meaning of the same forms, grammatical forms, mm -hmm. it may be paradoxical, mm -hmm. contradictory, or nonsensical. Questions? Fabiano, thank you for your presentation. <coughs> um, I want to say that um, your <coughs> that indeed uh, epistemic verbs and allocational verbs uh, have very much uh, formal features in common, and uh, maybe it's uh, rather perspective to uh, promising to <coughs> investigate the logic of epistemic and allocational verbs together. But I don't think that uh, these two kinds of verbs. Uh, behave um, <clears throat> uh, in one way always. Uh, epistemic verbs uh, we apply to propositions, allocation verbs we apply to utterances. Mm -hmm. And uh, this difference is very deep. Uh, um, <clears throat> it seems to me that for you uh, every epistemic act uh, can be reform reformulated into elocutionary act, or um, or maybe every epistemic act uh, has a correspondent uh, elocutionary act. This assumption uh, seems to me not very sound. Uh, do you understand what I mean? Uh, but it, it was the point of my... <laughs> for, for example, I, I, I quite agree with your analysis of Moore's paradox, but I don't agree with your analysis of Fitch's paradox. Mm -hmm. I find here some deep difference. Yeah, clearly. That's the reason why I say that a paradox may be turned into a paradigm 
provided that we translate the past, the epistemic verb into an irrecutionary verb, provided that. It's not a necessity. You cannot, I don't say that it's possible or we should reduce any epistemic verb into uh, an assertion or into a neurochemical verb. It's not my point. He said it's possible to translate. And from a specific translation of epistemic verbs, the paradox vanishes, but provided that you make this translation. But I never said that every epistemic verb is to be reduced to a neurochemical one. Never, of course. Fitch paradox is a very sound paradox. And this paradox remains the same with or uh, outside the educational approach of paradox, of course. I just say that it's possible to say, in one sense, this paradox is not serious. But in every other sense of the epistemic verb, it is serious, of course. So I agree with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? No. Thank you. <laughs>